Greetings, perfect love and light to Zambia, Africa, the whole universe, to the group itself, each and every individual. I give thanks for the welcome and for the opportunity to impart my experiences and stories. Interesting question. Well, I was born in Jamaica, um, father Rastafarian, mother and Jamaican Indian. Uh, the early years of my life, I grew up beside Bob Marley's house um, here in Jamaica. I left Jamaica at around nine years old or so, and I went to the United States where I was partly educated as well. Um, but I've traveled the globe. I've lived in England for many years. I've lived in Germany for many years. I have lived in many places in the world. So I guess um, being a mixed heritage, um, my mother being Jamaican Indian, um, Hindustani Indian, and my father being half Panamanian and half Jamaican, it's given me a, um, a different perception of life and people and cultures. The name Born Free, it comes from a brethren of mine in the UK by the name of Stephen, big up yourself Stephen, whom saw me as an individual that was free, that traveled the world, spoke from a, a place of free, a free mind, a free dome. I speak from a place of authenticity. And so, because I don't consider myself to have been groomed by one set of race, culture, or religion, I have a different approach to, to, to life, to culture, to spirituality. And in saying so, I guess I'm free from the teachings of society in the most part, even though I've learned and was educated by the society, I always questioned what I was taught and the motives for why I was being taught it. So that, I guess, is the collective reason why Born Free is Born Free. Okay, so this one is a very interesting question. I grew up beside Bob Marley and I did not know Bob Marley was famous until he died. Ironically enough, I played with his children, um, saw him regularly, and it wasn't until this man passed away and I saw him on television that he was famous internationally and that he was my friend's dad. It made me start to study his music analytically, lyrically, musically, uh, bridges, every aspect of his music. So I think my, my love affair with reggae music came from Bob Marley. Um, bear in mind, I was able to meet some of the top, top musicians as a result of living next door to Bob Marley, but I was a child to most of them. As I became a teenager, I think um, their influences had an impact on me. So genuinely, I fell in love with reggae music when I was around 11 years old, um, totally. I, I liked it before, but I really fell madly in love with it because of Bob Marley. Okay, so I guess from around the age of seven, I had a, a love affair with music, with chords, with bridges. I would listen and hug up my radio on the weekends and listen to the top 10 or top 40 around the world. And so at the age of around 12 or 13, I started to write. I realized I had a gift with articulating words. So as a result of starting to write and explore, you know, that side of my inner being and core and expression and expressiveness. But it wasn't until, um, I guess, when I was like, I would like to say 15 or 16, Tyrone Taylor um, brought me into a recording studio in Miami, um, Willie Lindo's studio. And there I met people like Jimmy Riley, Barris Hammond, um, Marcia Griffiths, just 
name them, countless, countless um, legends. And I got the opportunity to see them record. However, I was still young and still in school and I I got involved with things and this, that and the other as a teenager. But when I was, say, 19, I decided it was what I really wanted to do. My mom was insistent on me being a, a lawyer because of my articulation of words. Rest in peace, mom, I love you with all my heart. And so trying to please my mom and also please myself, I pursued both. So I studied, I, I took the music serious, but then professionally, I would say around 1993, I was 23 years old, I went to the UK and I had signed my first deal with a major label uh, with Warner Brothers. And that artist by the name of Jason Torres, J-A-Y-S-O-N, Torres, we had some success with the, um, with the records. But I then met Lee Sketch Perry and Lee changed my life entirely. Lee told me that the pop world was not where I belong, that mainstream music had too many guys like me already, but reggae and the culture of reggae music needed individuals such as myself. He told me he was going to teach me everything that he did not teach Bob Marley. And that was an interest factor for me. So I became, I, would, I like to look at Scratch as one of my musical dads. Also Willie Lindo. I would give these two individuals a great deal of credit for teaching me production and the business itself. Of, of music, um, but I, I can't leave out people like Ken Booth, Tyrone Taylor, Jimmy Riley, uh, Sticky, Sky High. There's just a lot of individuals that have played a role in my earlier days uh, for me to really understand the business of music, understand instruments and so forth. Okay, well, I left Jamaica as a child with my mom. My mom migrated to, to the U.S. And at the time, the U.S. was um, a better opportunity for her. And um, Jamaica was at a state where there was a lot of propaganda going on in Jamaica. My mother had lost probably half her wealth in a short period of time because... Uh, the fear of Jamaica becoming communist at that time made the currency drop in value tremendously. And a lot of individuals at that time that had great wealth in Jamaica left. They sold their properties and they left. And as my mom left as a kid, I had to leave. But as you, you, I've mentioned, I'm in Jamaica currently. And I had moved back to Jamaica when my mom passed away six years ago. Well, various aspects when it comes to the individual artists. For instance, with Tyrone Taylor, I was involved with many shows around the world with Tyrone. He considered me his little protege because I had the gift of the gab. Um, with Jimmy, Jimmy was someone that was more of a friend that likewise with Tyrone would help out with bookings. And this is in my early days. Um, when it comes to like a Lee Scratch Perry, that, that was, that's a complete different relationship. I've toured with Scratch, I've booked Scratch, I've produced Scratch, I've written with Scratch, I... I assisted Scratch and on many, many levels of consultancy, of, uh, of, it's a long list, but when I met Scratch, his first Grammy that he won is from an album called Jamaica's E.T. And that Grammy was attained after meeting me. Um, the knowledge that I imparted on to Scratch Perry about the industry and that he imparted on I was like two tennis players that were just trying to get each other better at their game. And we played tennis 
with each other constantly trying to get our games together. Now, I've produced people like Lee Scratch Perry, I've produced Kimani Marley, I've produced Gentleman, Andrew Tosh. So I guess as you've stated that I have wear many, many hats in this industry and I've learned the totality of the industry because Scratch taught me that if I didn't learn it, I was gonna have to pay someone to do it. And so I learned everything. And so is that I could be an instrument in anyone's career, anyone's career in the music industry, at any f facet, enabling them and facilitating them. I, I think Scratch best described me as a ninja in a car that most people don't see. They only see the exterior of the vehicle, but I'm one of the, the mechanics of the vehicle that makes it move and gets it to where it needs to get to. And so I, I, I take that humbly as a very good description of what I do and what I've done with many artists. That's a very interesting question. So I lived in England for 12 years. I lived in Germany for six years. I lived in Portugal for a year. I've lived in France. I've frequented Holland, Denmark, all of Europe in its totality. And I think that the music industry in America is different from the music industry in Europe. In America, it is geared on hype and superficialness. And in Europe, I would like to say it's more geared on talent and substance. And not to discredit or say there's not substance in America, but it's packaged differently. You know, in America, they spend a lot of money on promotion, 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 and they put a record out and they hope it hits. Well, in Europe, they put a record out and based upon how it's being reacted to dictates the amount of money they put behind it. So both approaches have an impact. And I guess learning both sides of the pond is what enabled me to be so successful. I think going into Europe and being on the ground in Europe was a great educator for me because most Jamaican artists come through Europe just on a tour and they're gone. I was one of the few Jamaicans on the ground there that was involved with booking artists, involved with doing events, involved with video production, involved with audio production, which made a complete difference to me and how I learned the industry and how I was able to impact individuals that I worked with or consulted or produced in the industry. Okay, Born Free Records officially was born in 2010. I was in Germany. I had just reached a stage where I wasn't going to wait on labels anymore. I didn't want to go through the headache of, of having to um, negotiate with labels. And so what I did is I started my own label and decided that I was going to produce some artists and release some music and just music that I wanted to release, not for money, but just because I wanted to do these projects, projects that touch my heart. So uh, I, 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 at that stage, I was in the process of producing Scratch's album, Masterpiece, that I've released. I had met Mamadi in Germany, who I was in a relationship with as well, a personal relationship as well as a musical relationship. And I started to produce her, um, eventually producing her album, Beautiful Soul, and releasing it. And I had also started the Road of Life Rhythm Project with a couple brethren. Big up yourself, Damas. And so this was the birth of Born Free Records, 2010, officially. Okay, well, yes, indeed. What happened is, pertaining to booking and promoting shows, I've been involved with a, a couple festivals here in Jamaica, particularly the Rockabessa Herbs and Music Festival, the Stepping High Ganja Festival in Jamaica, but also a lot of festivals in Europe. Um, Big up yourself, King C. Red, but I have a musical brethren, and as you can imagine, I have loads of associates around the globe. But there was a project called the Root Center, which was held at Summer Jam in Cologne, Germany. And for those that know about Summer Jam, it is the biggest reggae festival in all of Europe. I lived in Cologne, and so I became a part of this 
after party with King C Reds. And so we would put artists on the stage. I producing Mamadi, I clearly wanted to tour her and book her. And as a result of knowing so many artists in the industry, when they were planning tours to Europe, people would link me and I would assist them, filling out dates, giving them venues. Bear in mind that Mamadi was touring with Gentleman, whom was at the time one of the biggest names in the game in Europe. So a lot of venues were open to us, a lot of promoters, a lot of contacts. Being the producer of Lee Scratch Perry, being associated with Gentleman, producing Kimani Marley, and just being who I am naturally opened loads of doors. But I was also very, very direct in my approach in everything I do. Because what I realized when I went into Europe is that there was a lot of people living and surviving well out of my culture and my industry. However, we weren't gaining the full benefits of it. And you had individuals that felt like they wanted to shut a guy out like myself out of the marketplace. And so that gave me the determination to stay there and put my stamp down properly. Because there's no way you can use my culture, my music, my, my everything and package it and sell it. And then when I come there to, to eat a slice of the bread, you want to shut me out. So those individuals, I took a particular interest in shutting them down. As far as being a great producer, I think I've been a great student of music. And again, I want to give credit to Lee Scratch Perry and Willie Lindo, because these two individuals allowed me the opportunity to see how production was done. And then I want to thank a guy named Didier Guinoche and Richie out of the UK. Um, Richie Fingers, you know who you are. Well, Didier gave me the opportunity with a major record deal and a budget. And Richie is just a genius engineer and working with him allowed me to explore my musical dreams, visions, creativity, the way I thought, the way I saw Scratch Perry make music and Willie Lindo make music and all the music that I listened to that influenced me from a Michael Jackson to a Prince to from a Depeche Mode to a Jimi Hendrix. All these elements and dynamics, and let's not forget like a KRS-One, a DMX, the list of individuals that influenced me and impact me musically was endless. And so I think the combination and, and broadness of music and the appetite that I have for music allowed me to produce music from a complete different place, from a complete different mindset and imploring tactics tactics and techniques that I saw um, exercise through individuals. I mean, a white clef inspired me, a, the police inspired me, U2 inspired me, um, Annie Lennox inspired me, um, Smokey Robinson inspired me. Um, the list is, is endless of individuals that inspired me musically. So when it came to the, the idea of what I wanted to do, I always wanted to make a, a, a lot of records. I always wanted to be involved with songs that had substance and, and, and meaning and that could teach someone or impact someone's life like most of the music that impacted my life. Well, this is something the business side of the industry that individuals have to understand. You know, artists, is, you have to deal with the business side of it before you get into the, the, the creative side. Because if you don't protect yourself, and producers need to protect themselves as well, and learn the business, because sometimes the producers are the ones that are used to actually um, hurt the artists intentionally or not intentionally. But someone was behind the hurt. And generally, it's the distribution companies, um, sad to say, or management of the artists, individuals that feel like the artists are not intelligent or astute of the industry, and they take advantage of the artists. 
I think for me, I would tell every artist to make sure you enter into written agreements, make sure you, you deal with individuals that you are committed to and that are committed to you. Um, artists make a lot of mistakes along the way by jumping on other people's back um, like, like a frog to get up the ladder. And sometimes that costs them because if you sign a contract with someone, you've got to pay them. And if you sign four contracts with four different people, you're going to have to pay those four different people because they're going to come after you because they have a contract. As far as music and um, musically and instrumentation, all artists that play on a record have a, a right to go and register themselves and the parts that they played and, and get their, their publishing. Publishing is a big deal. Um, it's very relevant. And if you look into the publishing side of the of the music industry and protect yourself there that's a good good start into making sure that your intellectual properties are not taken from you or abused okay gamma licensing it's similar to what you have in america gamma licensing is a performance rights company based out of germany it's uh, the counterpart to PRS in the UK or BMI or ASCAP in the US or JCAP in Jamaica. It is a performance rights company, as I mentioned, where artists need to register their songs, musicians, producers, and all releases. They collect money, royalties, etc., as the other companies, as SASEM in France, etc., etc. Well, as far as getting your music published, there are two aspects of publishing, just to be clear. To publish your music, you join a performance rights company and you protect yourself on the aspects that of whether you be the musician or the, the lyrical writer. Now you can, you can start your own publishing company or you can assign your publishing to a publishing company. I advise individuals to start their own publishing company. And I'll give you an example. I did some production with Scratch Perry, as I said, and I'd given publishing to the individuals that work with us on the project. And we just signed a movie deal, um, a big movie deal with one of the tracks from Scratch Perry's album that I released and owned the master to. And the good thing about that is that this company is a very reputable company, but my publishing company, if I didn't have a good deal, would have gotten a lot of money out of this that they didn't deserve. Because what I've done is I've retained 100% of my publishing and I've given them a percentage of the masters. So that, uh, enables them or encourages them to go and place my masters a lot of places because they'll earn off of that. So publishing is a, is a very critical part because that's what you leave to your children. That's what's going to pay your grandchildren. I mean, if you look at the publishing of Bob Marley's likeness, it is a ridiculous number annually, but well worthy of the talent of the artist and the likeness of the artist. Yes, 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 young artist is up and coming talent. Well, I'll tell you this. I find like when I was starting out, it took someone to give me the opportunities to actually be able to do and show what I'm able to do. And so when an artist like Torch, who is an amazing artist, matter of fact, Torch and I are communicating today about some new production that we're mixing out for him now. Um, he has a massive international hit called Good Reggae Music. So I, I believe that I like to be involved with true talent and individuals that were God-given talent. And the selfish side of that is I want to be one of the first individuals that have taken their career serious. And I'm still coming from that old school approach of a DJ that thinks like, I'm the first guy to play that artist. I'm the first guy to bust that artist. So I still have that little pride inside of me of trying to spot talent before everybody else sees it. You know, that's a, that's a little pride thing. Uh, True Diva is just another amazing artist, a great vocalist. Mamadi is just an all-around 
gem. Uh, she's a great songwriter. I think what I truly loved about working with Mamadi is that she wrote from a place that was unique because she was born in communist Germany, lived behind the wall as an Afro-German. So she experienced some dynamics of racism that others may not have experienced. And so she wrote from a place that was very neutral to me, that I thought was appealing to a large number of people. So I would also bring Teflon. Teflon's another young artist that I helped. Um, there's a long list of them. And I just do it because I believe that they deserve an opportunity and they have songs that, that touch me that I like to be involved in. and. You know, as I said, the publishing side of it, it might not make me a lot of money now, but one day these songs could take off or these artists get really huge. And I want to be involved with their early productions. I want to be one of those guys that people say, you know, Born Free spotted their talent from the beginning. Uh, as far as I know, you can register um, with Gemma without being a citizen of Germany. I believe once you have a release in the territory, you have to actually register with them or the, the distributing label itself. Gemma is one of the strictest performance rights companies in the, in the world, and I have a lot of respect for them. Oh, the authorities. Again, the name Born Free. I've had several um, run-ins with um, the authorities um, on different instances. And I guess because, I'll give you an example. I was in England once, just got there, um, and I was in Hackney, it was, walking down the high street, and I saw, like, a young black kid being harassed by a couple of officers. So I stood up about maybe 50 feet away and I watched. And they turned around as they were going to get a little rough to see if anyone was around and they saw me. And they said to me, in Eng in, well, I w I'm American, and they say in this British accent, what are you looking at, mate? And I genuinely didn't get what they were saying because I was so caught up in, in, in thinking, what were they just getting ready to do? And I responded, I said, I'm looking at a couple white cops that looks like they were beaten up by black kids when they were in school and now they've got the authority and they're abusing their power of authority. And the cop comes up to me and he says, what did you say? You're nicked. And at that time in my life, I did not know what the term nick mean, meant. And so I said to him, I'm not Nick, I'm not Fred, I'm not Tom, and you can blah, 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 and turned and walked off. Both these officers left this kid and decided they were going to take me on. Long and short of it, um, I was brought down to the station. They called me a right Malcolm X, this, that, and the other. And a couple hours later, I was released after um, having a lawyer um, come and speak with them. But yeah, that doesn't deter me. I will always speak up for truth and justice and rights. And I'm not afraid of the authorities. I'm not afraid of judges. Put it this way, bro. I'm not afraid of God. I talk to God about everything. You cannot love or get close to something that you fear. And so my relationship with the Almighty is so intimate that I speak to him about everything. And because I feel I can speak to God about everything, I don't see why I can't speak to mankind about everything. Okay, so the road to life rhythm. You know, this is a huge project. It took me a great deal of time. I knew so many artists that wanted to work with me or wanted me to produce them. And I knew I didn't want to build so many rhythms at that time because I wanted to do something special. I wanted a project where I had a Marley, a Tosh, a Scratch Perry, and a Whaler on it. That's where that project started for me. And as people got wind of the project, people would contact me like a Peter Lloyd and say, brah, you cannot put this rhythm out and I'm not on it. 
So I produced a track with him. And the concept that I told everybody was, I want a piece of life's journey. I don't want it about money. I don't want it about guns. It can be about love of your partner. It can be about your, 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 your ups and downs in life. And so everyone took it serious. And, you know, they would ask me questions like, what subject matter would this person had written about? And I was like, I don't want anybody to know about anybody's song. I'm the only one that knows what Kimani's doing, Scratch is doing, and so forth. So the project literally took me three years, believe it or not. And it was worth it. You know, um, uh, Andrew Tosh, uh, Kimani Marley, Sensi Love, who is Bonnie Whaler's daughter, and the great Lee Scratch Perry. That was the, 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 the high point of that album for me. But then as I started getting songs, like, um, for instance, Like It Is by Raymond Wright, these songs send, send shivers through my spine. When I, when I listened to how individuals wrote songs like Mama and there was just so many artists on that rhythm. The album, I ended up releasing two, two CDs, a double CD album, and my partners, Damas, actually released a, like a seven song EP of other artists that just didn't make my cut. And so not that they weren't good enough, it's just that I had too many artists, too many songs on the same rhythm. But it's an amazing rhythm. I believe that rhythm won't get big for the next five years to its fullest potential. I think what I've learned about myself and my production is that it's way ahead of itself. And so the, the, what's happening now don't matter to me because I'm trying to create the next sound. But the road to life rhythm, wow, what an amazing journey. Um, even to have Gentleman and his wife on a song, that's on the album. So if you check that album out, you'll hear some new artists you've never heard about before. And like I said, I wanted to have one of their best songs in the earliest stages of their careers. Okay, the gentleman thing. Let me just clarify that once and for all properly. Gentleman is not a good guy. These guys have raped and robbed the music industry, particularly the reggae industry, I, I should say. Uh, Stefan Schumeister was Gentleman's manager. He is now, rest in peace, Stefan. He died because of the, the situation with Gentleman. He had a heart attack. Uh, Gentleman and him owned a company called Bush House Music, um, Bush House Booking. And what they did is they signed the top enchalant of the music industry out of Jamaica to tour Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. But the issue is that when people called the book a Sizzler or a Luciano, they were always busy, but Gentleman was always available. He had this game plan, dirty game plan. People, some people with no morals would say it was good business, but I don't think it's good business. So he would sign these artists, say for Summer Jam, but under the pretext that every one of these artists was gonna call him on their stage and big him up to authenticate him. And he would headline these festivals. So after being so close to him and his family and, 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 and learning how devious this guy was, um, I had to expose him. He'd done some things to me. Um, there's a, a YouTube video up there where Born Free Speaks About Gentlemen, the interview everyone's talking about. I made mention earlier about promoters not wanting Jamaicans to be in Europe to do shows. It was his camp as well. Uh, Rodney Kingston. I had booked Gentlemen to do a couple shows with Mamadi and they called the venues and pulled the venues from me and promised gentlemen without me to the venues. And when I asked gentlemen about it, he explained to me that Rodney and them don't like me being in their, their territory. So I said to him, so how the f can you be making reggae music and them making money out of reggae music, but me, a Jamaican, can't come here and make money out of reggae music? And he just smiled at me and, sh you know, like, shy cigar. 
in German, which means like, whatever, like what the fuck? It doesn't really matter. It is what it is. And that I took that personal. And whoever's gonna get upset about that, get upset, that's you guys' problem. But when you as a, a man coming from an island that sees your music, your culture being exploited and making a, a gentleman 30,000, 40,000 pounds per night per show, and then seeing the underhanded way that he built himself. I mean, even the, the, the pretext that he writes these songs, Daddy Rings and Jack Raddix writes all these hits, but Gentleman takes credit for them. So there's just so much I can go on about this Gentleman dude. I have no respect for him. Uh, he's a half decent entertainer, but he can't write a song to save his life. And truthfully, he's stolen Damian Marley's style and delivery. And it, I didn't learn all this until I was working so closely with him and his team. And it all fell apart after the diversity tour when he blatantly did something underhanded to his manager, Stefan Schumeister. And I'm living proof that he's a dirtbag gentleman. Gentleman is a dirtbag. Okay, so Africa is calling. This is a, an amazing song. I tell you how this came about. Um, many people might not know this, but Mamadi's grandfather was the president of Sierra Leone for a few decades. And when I started to date her, I was invited, she and I were invited to one of her uncle's 50th or 60th birthday party. And this was my first opportunity to really meet some ambassadors out of Africa and sit down and talk with them on a personal level. And so after a few hours of, of conversation, I asked the gentleman, uh, six of her uncles were ambassadors at the time. And so I asked these guys, you know, what can I do to assist Africa? And I told him that I had this idea to write a song with Mamadi about Africa and that, you know, we, we want to do this. And so after speaking with them, we decided to write about the beauties of it. Ironically, uh, Mamadi and I came to Jamaica and we were at the museum, Bob Marley's museum, which is his house that he lived in, which is next door to where I grew up. And Kimani was there. Kimani came up to me and asked me to come to the studio with him, that he was doing some production, he like my assistant. And I said, fair enough, but in exchange, I'm gonna want you to sing a song with Mamadi. And I got the song already, it's already written, it's called Africa is Calling. And he listened to it and he was like, sure. So technically, Mamadi and I wrote that song and I gave Kimani credit as a, a writer so he could earn from the publishing but it's an amazing song i used to watch people cry in tears when mamadi sang that song on stage okay can can all right so i have a good brethren named kofi in new york who's african and he manages and produces Can Can. And so what happened is Kofi came to me and said, listen, I got this artist and I needed to do some work with him. And I was like, okay, and let me hear the artist. And Queen, I heard Queen and Queen was just an amazing, amazing song. So I got behind the project. Um, I do a lot of marketing consultants and promotion with Kofi, actually. I mean, he's brought me, he's the one that brought me Maxi Priest. I mean, Maxi Priest came to me via Kofi, in all honesty. So I want to big up Kofi. And Kofi and I go way, way back because he's a part of Kimani Marley's team back in the days as well. This music industry is very small. It's a tiny little circle on each continent that is connected in one fashion or the other. Oh, Maxi Priest. So it's funny, you know, I'm sitting at home and I get a phone call and the person says, hey, born free, it's Maxi. I go, Maxi who? He goes, Maxi Priest. I go, Maxi Priest, wow, how you doing, bro? He goes, good, I need your help. I was told you're the best in the business to contact, so I'm contacting you. 
I said, who told you that? He said, Kofi. So I said, all right, here's the deal, Max. Give me half an hour, let me call you back. And so I hung up and I called Kofi. Kofi broke it down to me and says, Free, I'm, I'm going to pay you to work on Maxi's project. Don't even tell Maxi that I'm paying you. Just do this for me. And so I called Maxi back and I spoke with him. And Maxi, I went and met him. And we spoke and we, I reviewed the project. And I said, OK, this is the best way forward. We started to consult him and started the press campaign uh, alongside his press team and his and so I became a, a intricate part of his team a, 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 a guru to Maxi if I'm to say so in a humble fashion so Maxi had a, a great respect for me and I had a great respect for Maxi and so the relationship just just it flowed like a river to the sea um, I'd been a great fan of his music. I'd met him a few times before, but we'd not really worked together. Uh, matter of fact, Willie Lindo had produced um, stuff with him. And so that was my first introduction to Maxi. But to actually to be working closely with him um, was these projects. And I can tell you what, he's an amazing artist, um, well, well versed of the industry, a, a great professional, got a solid team around him. And I'm happy to be a part of his consultancy. Um, I do plan to do some production with him in the near future. But the bottom line is that it's again just another project that came my way and I give my thousand percent to every project that I'm involved in. Maxie's a brilliant artist, a brilliant performer with a track record that's there that no one can dispute. And so in a nutshell, that's how that relationship started and still is. <laughs> I love that. Conrad Glaze. Conrad's just a simple, humble dude. Walks down the street like anybody else. Uh, I pride myself on being a fabric in any community that I live in. Um, I'm polite. I'm kind. I'm single. I'm not married. I have three children, two in the UK that are in their 20s, and I have a young son who's going to be three years old, Josiah, on the 1st of February, who lives in Jamaica. I am a, a full-time dad with Josiah. Josiah lives with me for the most part and travels with me, everything. I, I, I love him with all my heart. I love all three of my children dearly. Um, Conrad Glaze is a guy that believes in helping the poor. Conrad Glaze is a guy that believes in feeding the poor. Conrad Glaze is a guy that believes in educating the youths. Conrad Glaze is a guy that if you saw him on the street and you needed help, you can count on him to help you. Uh, Conrad Glaze is a guy that talks to window washers, homeless people, um, Conrad Glaze is, a, is just me, it's just, I am my heart. And so music is my industry, it's my love, but my heart is who I am. And so Conrad Glaze's heart is, is loving, kind, firm. I hope to get married one day soon, but at this moment in my life, I've been single for a few years and just paying attention to my child. Um, watching him grow, uh, spend my time going to the farms with him. We travel um, to America from Jamaica. Um, we go to the parks. One of the things we do a lot is he has a balance bike. And so I live um, uptown Kingston and it's kind of hilly. So we go for rides on his balance bike. I'm trying to get him re to, to really get good at that. But yeah, that's how I spend my days. Conrad Glaze is a guy that cooks at home and eats at home. Conrad Glaze is an introvert, outrovert, that if it can't help the people, he doesn't see the purpose of doing it. If I can't touch a life, I don't see the purpose of living. That's Conrad Glaze. Okay, so this one you are gonna find interesting. How many of you guys remember Terry Ganzi? Well, Terry Ganzi is a legend within himself. And about a year ago, two young producers out of the UK came to me. Um, well, one of them came to me, Ken, big up yourself, Ken. And he asked me about some, if I could assist him. 
and so I chose to assist him. Um, the project has been recorded, Torch has been recorded on the rhythm, uh, Terry Ganzi and a few other artists. I'll be currently mixing those out in the next couple weeks and set for release soon. But Terry Ganzi is not voiced for anybody in many decades. I believe I'm the first person he's voiced for in a very, very long time. Also, I briefly mentioned that um, a production I did called Masterpiece is being featured in a new film um, that is, it's called Winter Starts Now is the name of the movie. And it's by um, the, the top winter sports filmmaker. And so it's set to be very successful. Music is on the frontier. Um, now that COVID seems to be passing and we're gonna be able to start doing events again, I'm looking to, to bring artists into various countries. I'm looking to, to expand on new talent, the, the collaborations, I'm actually doing, um, putting Scratch Perry's voice on this Terry Ganzi track. So if any of you are Scratch Perry fans or Terry Ganzi fans, that's something big to look out for. And again, check my website. Um, keep abreast of what's going on. See, keep abreast of what's going on. Um, Cause there's always something coming. Um, I work with so many different artists on so many different levels that it's hard to really communicate on every single thing that's going on, but there's always something going on. Well, I want to big you up too, fam, and for giving me the opportunity to speak on your platform as well. Uh, and you know I'm a part of the platform and all the amazing artists that you've interviewed as well and those that are to, to come. I truly want to give thanks to you, bro, for everything that you do also in the music industry, in the reggae industry particularly, and continue the great works. Time does fly. I'd like to say one perfect love and light to each and everyone listening. And remember this, only you can stop you. Seen? Only you can stop you. Don't let anybody else stop you. Seen? Perfect love and light.